Good morning. I think it's still morning. <clears throat> I'm Joanne Conroy. I'm the CEO of Dartmouth Hitchcock and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And I have with me here today Ed Marins, who's the Chief Clinical Officer of Dartmouth Hitchcock and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health System. And we are here today to talk about the COVID-19 concerns that we've all been dealing with. Yeah. Dartmouth Hitchcock Facebook Lives are part of our normal monthly communication to our communities. And thank you for people that tune in every single month to hear us interview the experts in our organization. Given we know that there'll be a lot of outside viewers today, this one will be curated a bit differently. I've been told I can't really wing it as the CEO. And um, so I just want to make sure that all of you have the information that you need in order to make the right decisions for you and your family. First, there's been a lot of reporting in the media around the first patient who tested positively for COVID-19, who is a Dartmouth Hitchcock employee. I'd like to start with a recognition that this employee was directed by Dartmouth Hitchcock to self-quarantine and did not comply. We fully understand this causes great concern. And this concern exists both inside and outside our organization. We will not provide any additional details around this employee or any other patients. It's the law and we comply with it. The most important point to understand is that we followed all appropriate procedures and we are confident that no patients were put at risk. Ed and I are here today because we want to reassure everyone that actions have been taken to contain the situation and we are very proud of the success of the containment to date. It's important at this time for us to focus on the fact that we have anticipated this situation. It's evolving the way we have planned and prepared for, and here is what we need to focus on. Thank you for those who have questions, many of the questions around medical advice, and for those, we encourage you to contact your provider, just as we always would. If your questions aren't medical, we welcome you to post in the comment thread um, on Facebook, or you can email social at hitchcock.org. And now we'll kick off with some questions that we have already received. And if you provide questions while we're online, they'll be provided to me in a live feed. Dr. Marins, Ed, so what's the most important point that you wanna to share today with our audience? Well, I think uh, we're almost a week into this and I think we feel really uh, good about the processes we've, we've put in place uh, and how we continue to provide care here. We've identified individuals. We have people that uh, we've asked uh, to, to be uh, uh, on quarantine, but uh, uh, we've identified no new cases. We've tested people and we feel like we've got all the mechanisms in place to, to, to provide the care and coordination. Um, the state of New Hampshire declared a public health incident um, what does that mean? So the state made this announcement uh, two days ago, which allows them to kind of tap into a pool of volunteers, allows hospitals to coordinate with the state in a, in a much more coordinated fashion, allows us to work together to make sure that uh, we're all sharing information as we, as we respond to this, not only at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, which is really a, across the state, uh, but other hospitals as well. So it was reported that the state brought in a truck to the Lebanon airport yesterday. Who were they testing? So the state uh, is working on developing mobile testing. This is actually something we, we developed at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and we have actually um, pioneered here. Uh, and this is a methodology in which individuals that the state has identified that require testing um, can drive up in their car, are properly um, trained uh, teams can meet them with all their protective gear. They roll down their windows. We do the testing of the uh, samples from the nose and the mouth. They roll the windows back up and they can drive away. We don't have to decontaminate a room and it, it provides a lot of privacy as well. Um, so we have been doing that here and we've been sharing and training the state 
and the state has now uh, set up the airport as an easy drive-up site. Um, and the testing there is not necessarily people from Dartmouth-Hitchcock. It is an easy central site for the state to, uh, to have other people who they've, who they've decided require testing mm -hmm. in the state to, to access. Mm -hmm. So what happens in the hospital in an emergency situation like this? So hopefully we never get to an mm -hmm. emergency situation, and clear, but, but we have to be prepared for everything. And just as we're prepared for everything on a day-to-day -day basis when we don't have this virus, we're prepared for COVID-19. So we've been doing this kind of high threat infection training for years. Uh, we were part of response to MERS-CoV, other coronaviruses mm -hmm. that, have, that have been threats. Uh, we were a reference hospital for the whole Ebola crisis that happened, although we never received patients. Um, so our preparation for an emergency event is that we've done a lot of training with the MS in the field, first responders that those people are protected and we can transport someone uh, from another hospital or from their home or somewhere in the community in a safe fashion. Uh, we have a completely uh, designated area in our emergency uh, department that has negative pressure rooms where we can provide care um, and care for periods of time up into and including uh, critical care. Uh, we have mechanisms of converting and establishing units in our hospital which can, can provide the full spectrum of regular supportive care through intensive care. So it isn't just having the facilities, but it's also the teams. And we have been maintaining a team of trained individuals that are, it, that are skilled in high threat infectious diseases with the proper uh, training and protective equipment for years. We're now expanding the training to other people, other teams that may encounter these, um, the patients if we have them, and that training is going on right now. So we have the people, we have the facilities, we have everything. And the other thing is that all this can happen at the same time we're providing the regular care that we need mm -hmm. to. People will still come here and have babies. <coughs> People will come to their geriatrics appointment, their neurology appointment. They'll, everything else is, is, is happening here. So we're safe and open for business while at the same time working to take care of, of people that may need a higher level of care. People probably don't appreciate that this is driven by something called incident command. That is a team that stood up on Monday. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to observe them. And yeah. it's really incredibly impressive. Um, Talk a little bit about that. So Incident Command is a group of hospital leaders that are trained in, in emergency management techniques uh, that interface with uh, Homeland Security, police, municipalities, other healthcare systems that know uh, around, that can mobilize ambulatory, inpatient providers, nursing, finance, all held together really with communications mm -hmm. and the work that we do that uh, analyze the situation, the potential opportunities, the issues that we need to deal with, and can really mobilize quickly to make some decisions and, uh, and uh, come up with action plans. And this can be everything from you know, a boiler, we had a problem with a boiler that flooded an area and we've got to come up with a plan, a, a network outage that goes down a little bit longer through very high threat infections and issues that may be vexing the world, parts of the United States and us here at dartmouth Hitchcock. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the difference between quarantine and isolation. Why is it only 14 days? Yeah, so, so isolation is when someone has symptoms or, uh, or has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and that is to, is to remain in your house. You've, you're isolated from all other individuals or isolated in a place where you don't come in contact. So that's for diagnosed individuals um, or people that have significant symptoms who are waiting for testing. Quarantine is when you've had a contact, where you're an individual that has had a contact with someone who has been diagnosed, but you don't have symptoms. Mm -hmm. You just, we've added an abundance of caution, we've said, we think that you should go home, not, should not be in the workplace, but, but you can be in the home mm -hmm. uh, while we await and monitor you. And the monitoring really happens uh, through the state. And all these decisions about whether someone should be on isolation or whether they should be quarantined are, are decisions that are made at the state level, clearly working with our teams. Mm -hmm. um, but the decision around 14 days is really the natural history of this infection. Mm -hmm. We expect that if someone who came in contact and um, is going to develop any symptoms related to COVID-19. We think it's going to happen within 14 days. Yeah. Now, I've received a note that some people are having a hard time hearing us. I want to remind people to try to unmute your um, the sound on your computer. And with the new Windows program, sometimes that's a little bit difficult to find. But um, 
also to remind people that if you can't hear this well, it will be posted afterwards on our um, Hitchcock.org site, so you can access it any time of the day. Um, can you give us a sense of how many people are in quarantine? We've actually received that question quite frequently. I think we have, and we've talked uh, with a number of other media outlets. At this point, working with the state, we're not at liberty to talk about the number mm -hmm. of quarantined or people that are isolated. The state will report as it sees fit in terms of the number of people that are positives, but is not reporting on the number of people that are quarantined. What I would say is that we've made, we've been very judicious in our decisions uh, and very thoughtful about people that have come in contact and people that, that need quarantine. The CDC has released some guidelines yesterday uh, that uh, even ease this a little bit more, thinking that if people are, have come in contact, they can return to the workplace and work, return to what they're doing and monitor their symptoms. We are continuing to maintain a, a, a much more restrictive perspective, mm -hmm. um, although disruptive to people's lives if you have to be quarantined, but we're being extra cautious. Yeah. Uh, but we're not, we're not talking about numbers at the behest of the state. What does it mean to be in close contact? Like, are we in close contact? We are in close contact. <laughs> um, so we should talk about this. Okay. So we have three definitions of, of close contact. One is you've been within six feet of someone for more than more than 30 minutes. So you might have been sitting in, next to someone in a conference. Mm -hmm. You might have, uh, so, so within six feet for 30 minutes or more. Close contact is this kind of contact, face-to-face mm -hmm. -face contact mm -hmm. for really any period of time. And then there's bodily contact. Someone who, who, who you gave a hug to, or you might have kissed, or you know any kind of contact. Mm -hmm. So these are very restrictive guidelines, mm -hmm. but th those are the guidelines that, that we're using right now. Mm -hmm. I've actually been very impressed how you have been so thoughtful about identifying the people that um, have what we term close contact and making sure that they were notified. Um, is it safe for people who live with a quarantined individual to be in the public, at school, or at work? So this is one of the hardest things for people to kind of grasp. If someone's home and they have to be quarantined, why can their family continue to do what they normally do? And this is based on epidemiologic principles, which is how did disease spread, how are they shared, and we know the incidence of actually an asymptomatic person who came in contact transmitting it in an asymptomatic state to their family is very, very low. Those people can go about their normal normal mm -hmm. business. Now, if a quarantined individual develops symptoms, it begins to change. Mm -hmm. They're contacted by the state and we test and do things, but it is perfectly safe for kids mm -hmm. to go to school, for uh, other people that live in the house to go to go to work and to do their do do what they're going to do. And this is not just an issue for those of us here at Dartmouth Hitchcock or in this region in New Hampshire. This is being faced and questioned across the United States. Mm -hmm. We now know that this is spreading uh, throughout communities. Uh, we feel really happy with our containment and what we've done here. But this is one of the the troubling mm -hmm. aspects. This also gets to that issue of. Um, Anything like this that, 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 that is across the world and, and affecting us invokes fear. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we're afraid, we, we think of things that, that may not make sense. We make emotional decisions and, rather than uh, rational ones. And we, yeah. wanna, we, want, we are very much focused on being completely honest and open about our approach, how you can reduce your risk, what we're doing, how we're keeping people safe, and what you can continue to do. And doing that completely based on evidence-based science. We're following the CDC, we're working with the state, mm -hmm. and um, we're doing a lot of good work. Yeah, uh, we receive a number of questions about care. You know, when we walk in here, it looks like business as usual. The incident command is doing a great job yeah. because you wouldn't know all the work that's going on in the incident command room. Um, one question, a young woman asked if it was safe for her to deliver her baby here. Absolutely, and people are delivering their babies as we speak. So the care that we, that we're, that we provide at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, and, and not just at Dartmouth-Hitchcock here in Lebanon, but across our community group practices, uh, which is a big part of our care delivery, absolutely continues, so are, all the care. There are questions also about visitors. So. Yeah. Um, what precautions should visitors take? And if they have a family member that maybe has a pre-existing condition or is immunocompromised, what precautions should they take if they um, want to come here and either visit somebody and or receive care? So there's no, we're not making any restrictions on people. We take care of a lot of people that are immunocompromised. Uh, we have a, you know, we have a cancer center and we know there are other conditions that change people's immunity. Um, we are not restricting or asking people to change their practices. We want to see them for care. 
Um, we're asking them to practice all the safe practices around hand washing, covering their mouth when they cough or sneeze, um, and uh, we will continue that. Uh, we certainly want to know if anyone has traveled and been abroad mm -hmm. and is at risk. The other thing that we're beginning to do, and people may have questions about this, you know, we have a, 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 have a robust connected care center that, mm -hmm. that is engaged in, in telehealth across not only our system but across the state and other states as well. We are rapidly ramp ramping up our capabilities to provide telehealth appointments. Now we mm -hmm. have already started this before all this happened with a televirtualist program that we've mm -hmm. developed where we will, we will in, the, in, the, in a short period of time be able to develop uh, tele-appointments. So if someone is, can't come in for an appointment and they want to have a tele-appointment with a physician, mm -hmm. we can book someone into a, into, a, yeah. into a slot like this and we're going to expand this capability. Um, and, and as we think about people, not just from our system, but other areas who may be quarantined or have to care for someone and they can't get here, we can provide those kind yeah. of capabilities. So we're rapidly developing that. Yep, that's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about tests. What's the latest on testing? Because we heard that the numbers of the test kits actually were limited. Well, we know even at the, at the, f at the national level, the CDC has a limited amount of tests. Mm -hmm. And we've been caught a little bit behind at the national level in terms of being able to have enough tests that are distributed. They're distributed at the state level. In, in the state of New Hampshire, we were allocated uh, only 60 tests. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say we, it's not Dartmouth-Hitchcock, but we work, the state has the tests, the testing capability, um, and it's a limited number. Mm -hmm. uh, we coordinate with the state for every single test that we, that we do. We produce, we have the swabs and all that, and then we send the vials to the state and they're run in Concord. Um, the FDA has actually approved hospitals and other systems to, to work on their own testing. We have, uh, we have purchased an analyzer and we are working with obtaining the reagents so we can do our own testing. Mm -hmm. The important thing about testing, and I think ev people are worried and, and wanting to get tested to make sure they don't have it, um, is that the testing only works when you have symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it only works if you've got a, a cough, where you've got a fever, where you have shortness of breath, those symptoms that we think are manifest as mm -hmm. part of this disease. So you can't just test someone who has no symptoms, or mm -hmm. as we often say, is asymptomatic. Yeah. Yes, I'd heard that the test actually wasn't validated Correct. in asymptomatic patients. And who decides who gets tested? Because my understanding is some states are doing it differently. Um, we've worked based on CDC guidelines. Every test that we order and the state does with other hospitals, and they've, they've worked with there are other people being tested outside of Dartmouth-Hitchcock. It really is uh, an exposure to mm -hmm. a, a known case of COVID-19, mm -hmm. exposure in a country where there's no, where there is significant um, presence of COVID-19, mm -hmm. and the CDC recognizes South Korea, mm -hmm. Japan, Italy, China as places in Iran where there's the evidence of COVID-19. Mm -hmm plus the development of symptoms mm -hmm. and the symptoms we talked about. Those are the criteria for, for testing. There may be other times where there's some concern or th those, those criteria aren't quite met, but the, the state may make the decision to test. Yeah. Um, we have another question about business travel. Um, how is um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health approaching this? And I know a lot of um, companies and other educational institutions are really kind of grappling what should the guidelines be? Yeah, I think this is something that's evolving. Uh, I, this is a fluid situation. Mm -hmm. And so, so major corporations have limited international travel. So mm -hmm. business, finance, some higher education have limited international travel right. um, and, and, and limited even travel around the United States. We have not banned international travel. We've mm -hmm. certainly people can't travel to the to the countries where there's the highest risk, and anyone returning from those areas would needs to be in quarantine. Uh, so we have not necessarily banned people from from going to other places as as this evolves. We're asking people to to f think thoughtfully about their travel, but yeah. this is really evolving yeah. even as we speak. I think in the Department of Medicine Graham rounds, we asked people to actually let occupational health know if they were going to travel internationally yep. and also check with them yep. when they came back just so we make sure that we yep. identified people that um, we should actually ask to self-quarantine yeah so I think there's self core I think the list that the CDC recognizes as being risk it's now in over 70 countries yeah. it's probably not going to be limited to the five that we have I think that list will grow yeah. and I think people will make um, decisions on their travel based on that. I think there'll be a lot of self-limiting uh, uh, of travel. I think it'll also, you know, there's a, 
the CDC talks about a, a, the principles of social distancing, and, and I think we're going to get to a time where, hey, if we can have a phone meeting, let's do that. Yeah. If we can have a meeting where we meet uh, through uh, Zoom or telepresence or VTEL or one of these other modalities, we'll do that. And I think that as we, as we want to continue meeting and, and doing the work that we have to do, we'll, we yeah. will do it through a number of mechanisms. Yeah. Here's a question for me. What do you do as CEO in times like this? I think it's communicate, communicate, communicate. Yeah. And this is one of the ways that we feel is very effective to communicate with people in our community and the patients that we serve. <clears throat> so we talked about a negative pressure room. Some people don't know what that means. What is a negative pressure room? It means the air that circulates in the room around a patient that might have a disease that has droplets and airborne particles never leaves the room. So it's a little bit of a vacuum in the room itself. There is actually a little bit of a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, there's a vacuum in the room. So, so norm it, it, you know, normally the air could leak out under the door or around the edges. It doesn't in these rooms. The room has a, has a vacuuming effect. Yep. It goes through a, a filter that filters nearly 100% of everything in that room, a special filter that, that we use. So these are, these are specially designed rooms. And anyone entering that room would have protective, uh, protective clothing and, and things like yep. that. There's another excellent question about stronger surveillance effort, both in the state of New Hampshire and Vermont. You know, sometimes we forget that we actually sit on the border between two yeah. states. Um, what information do we have about that? I'm not sure I have a lot around surveillance. Uh, if we think about, we have two vectors that we think about those that are infected that we can track really well, mm -hmm. and those that have traveled places and have come back with this. So I mm -hmm. think increasing, um, so schools b knowing about um, people that have traveled. I think yeah. uh, if we think about the population that often travels in the spring and may go to Europe and may do things, it's colleges, it's high schools, school it's schools, vacations, school vacation, meetings, people yeah. coming back. So I think the surveillance may be, let's get a better idea of who's been out there and who travels and where they're coming back from to understand where the next case might be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you know we will have ongoing discussions with the, with, with the state. We're not getting to a point where we're asking everyone these questions or checking people at the door or doing, or, or doing that. that mm -hmm. That's not the guidance that we're getting from the state. That said, we are talking with the state every single day. Um, there is a comment that we know that viewers have found it frustrating that we can't share all the numbers, but the state controls the release of any numbers related to testing or people that are in self-quarantine. Um, is this virus like the flu? And will there be less risk once it gets warmer? I mean, there was a lot of yeah. um, kind of discussion about, it's just gonna go away when yeah. the spring comes here. So it's a lot like the flu. You know, if you have a cough and, and you've got a fever and you feel rotten. Um, so this is a coronavirus, which is in the family of viruses with colds and they feel, which is different than mm -hmm. influenza, a different mm -hmm. viral family, um, but they make you feel rotten. And in fact, all the people that present with these symptoms, even with a good story of contact, we're testing them for the flu. And sometimes we're finding people that have influenza. Yeah. Sometimes we find that they have um, uh, other, other, other viruses as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, that's the hard part about this. Viruses tend to give you these kind of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now this question about will it go away, we know there's a natural pattern of viral presence. It comes in the winter, and they ebb throughout the spring and into the summer. Mm -hmm. But I think there's been some discussion, even listening to Anthony Fauci uh, you know, at NIH and the, and the CDC talking about this virus may, may subside mm -hmm. as the weather, get, but it may become part of just the, the viruses that are around every year and it may, yeah. may become one of those that we just continue to see. But we'll, we'll have to see how things go. Yeah. Um, another question, do we know the testing results of the tox students that were exposed. And th this is a story that's been in local and some Look, of the national yeah. newspapers. Yeah, so we're not privy to those results. The tox students uh, would be tested in collaboration with the state. Mm -hmm. um, and the state uh, releases, uh, has control over the release of, mm -hmm. of that. Any, any release, any, so any positives, the state undertakes an investigation of those contacts, tracing, quarantine, and reviews everything. We have gone through every possible contact mm -hmm. of the people that we've identified with the state, and that's why we think our work has been so good and that we have not had any, of, any other positives in the people uh, who we think we've identified. But as it relates to other positives or other people under surveillance and being tested in the state, even those in, in, in the next town over, uh, that would be with the state. Yeah. 
Um, what about employees of tourism, hotel, and food service workers um, where you have no idea where the guests have been that actually go to a hotel or a resort? I did notice in our cafeteria this morning we have no more salad bar. Well, and I, and all everything is in small, individually portioned cups. Well, I will tell you, um, the salad bar changes have nothing to do with our <laughs> coronavirus. We have a lovely salad bar. Uh, we, as we have ongoing compliance with things like the Joint Commission, we have certain standards around food okay. preparation, how food needs to be out, and it is. And unfortunately, uh, we had planned on this, and the, the timing of it is just is just different. Oh, okay. The salad here is excellent. I have them every day. Um, but that's a, that's a different thing. Okay. Your question about about hotels and what what should I worry about? So we know that the virus can continue to exist on on surfaces, and we should practice the same kind of hygiene in our hotels as we would in any public space. So it isn't mm -hmm. like you arrive at a hotel and they've and they've you know had a hazmat team clean your room when you've gotten out of an Uber or a taxi and been right. at the train. I mean, right. you know, so the same things that you would do in, we would ask you to do the same things when you travel that you do here. Traveling is an opportunity to interact with a lot of viruses. So yeah. hand washing, everyone should have a little bottle of alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizer yeah. with them. You should use it after you touch any surface, doorknobs, um, and get out of a cab, do any of those kind of things when you, when you travel before eating. Uh, these are the kind of things that we recommend. So travel can be a, an, a time when you have more exposure, typically because you're more mobile and touching more things, right. but that would be the recommendation. Yeah, you know, one thing that people don't think about um, cleaning is their phone, their cell phone. And well, maybe we'll do a little video of how to <laughs> clean your phone. <laughs> and, and that's been shown to actually uh, just be just as bad as right. touching we, doorknobs. We do take yeah. our phone everywhere and we don't think of it as, yeah. uh, as a surface that needs cleaning. Yeah. Uh, do I need to worry about going to public events or going to places where there are a lot of people? Uh, right now there have not been recommendations. Um, different organizations have limited and canceled events mm -hmm. uh, where people are traveling from around the world or around the country. I think people are self are deciding themselves about limiting travel, mm -hmm. but we have not limited events here. We had an incredible grand rounds this morning with mm -hmm. Paul Farmer, who wrote, uh, uh, has written extensively and done work in Haiti. We had a full room. We are going to continue to have educational events mm -hmm. and meetings. Dartmouth College has not canceled its events, so we're we're trying to do this in a in a conscientious mm -hmm. manner, and, uh, and and we'll 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 change things as things evolve right. as needed. Right. Is there a shortage of supplies you need? You know, there was a lot of conversation about yeah. shortage of masks. Yes. So uh, there is ongoing concern about mm -hmm. uh, adequate adequate supplies. We have adequate supplies at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, but the supply chain uh, cycle is not what it used to be. Uh, a lot of ingredients, parts, and uh, things that we put together are made in China. Mm -hmm. Even though China may have a, a resurgence of their manufacturing, the, the shipping and the timeline uh, may be mm -hmm. disrupted. We know we make some of these things in the United States, but they're still dependent on, uh, on, on uh, products from China. So um, we are actively looking at, uh, looking at our supplies. We're okay right now, but we also want to make sure that everyone in our network, our member yeah. hospitals, are stable as well. So yeah. we're being very careful about how we use things. This is also what we've talked about in terms of um, you don't need, a mask doesn't prevent you from getting COVID. Yeah. Um, the particles are too small. Uh, we wear masks. We ask people to wear masks if they have a cough and they present, but we know that it's not something that's going to prevent it. So this mad rush to, to buy masks is, is not necessarily the, the right move. And people traveling on airplanes with masks, probably they're not, no. it's not a very effective It's technique. not effective. Um, there's a question about regional capacity, New Hampshire and Vermont, for testing um, beyond the test kits that the CDC has developed and provided. Um, I do know that University of Vermont is doing the same thing that we are. Um, trying to look at doing some of the yep. testing in-house. Yep. Um, do we have any idea about the timeline? When is that supposed so to I, increase? I, I, would, I would like to say that we would do this in a matter of days, but it's dependent on reagents. We've, we've purchased an analyzer. We're waiting for to test and do the validation of the test as well. Yeah. So that's in the works right now. Again, this is not, again, this is only, we would only use this in the same way we would use it for the state-based tests for people that have a significant risk factors and um, who have symptoms. Yeah. Um, this is an excellent question. So what do we do if we have one of our providers, a physician or um, APRN or a PA, that's exposed to the virus while they're treating patients? 
and um, you know, I, I think it comes up with testing because it's a nasal and pharyngeal, the back of the throat yeah. test, where you're like right in the line of fire yeah. for droplets. Um, what do we do if a provider is exposed um, to protect them and to minimize transmission? So first of all, no providers should be exposed. Mm -hmm. and, and what we feel really good about, even in our first case, when this person presented, they were queried with the same questions we ask everybody. Have you traveled? Do you have symptoms that we've been doing for a long time, not just in this outbreak? Mm -hmm. They were immediately identified, immediately given a mask. When they went into the room, the person that, that tested them was, uh, was appropriately uh, uh, covered and, and, and had the appropriate PPE. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think we are at our time. We're at our time, okay. But I wanna um, thank everybody for uh, participating in Facebook Live, and we are open and safe for people to receive their care here. I actually have the opportunity to look out on the patient parking lot, and I do know that people are circling, looking for spaces, so um, the most of the community has gotten the word that this is the place to really receive high quality care in the state of New Hampshire. So thank you everybody for Thanks. participating with Facebook Live. Thanks.